What if you could run ads to everyone who has visited your competitors' websites? Hi, I'm Jared Krause. I am the host of the Buying Online Businesses podcast, and today I'm speaking with Justin Sardi, who specializes in bootstrapping software companies. He started helping entrepreneurs and businesses build audiences, collect leads, and make sales through the use of YouTube and YouTube ads. He's a former founder of TubeSift and Video Ad Vault, which are software tools for YouTube advertisers, and now he's been marketing online since 2011 and has helped thousands of businesses and entrepreneurs increase their revenue with this software and training courses. And in this podcast episode, Justin and I talk about how to build a successful YouTube channel. We talk about what a good video looks like on YouTube for your YouTube channel and how to create those. We also talk about how to run ads to your YouTube channel videos to grow your YouTube channel organically, but with a little bit of ads, a little bit of a a mixture and play on words there. We also uh, talk about the difference between a YouTube channel video and then a YouTube ad or an in-stream YouTube ad, what the differences are and why they're so different. We also talk about how to create a winning YouTube ad that is an in-stream YouTube ad that actually gets you leads and more sales. We dive into targeting on YouTube and how you can target almost anyone you want with YouTube ads based on using Google. And then we talk about some tools that Justin has built that I mentioned just before, how they work and how they can help you crush it on YouTube. Now there's so much value in this podcast episode. Video marketing is not going away, it's only getting better. And it's such a great place to build a relationship, harness a relationship, build trust with your audience and make more money online through your online business. Enjoy. Have you been lied to about how to increase organic traffic and grow your website? I too used to think that all you needed to do is add more content and gain backlinks. But this just doesn't work. More content and more links alone is not the answer. Nor do you need to butcher your website with generic SEO changes you picked up on some crummy online tutorial leaving with a Frankenstein website that's slow and clunky. And because I got sick of seeing great people with great websites struggle to grow them, I decided to do something about it. I created an SEO service, which is not just about publishing content and getting links. Sure, we offer that. But first, we give you quick wins, which are SEO tweaks we can make to your website that actually boost your rankings. And then we lay out a killer SEO strategy to acquire more traffic and revenue that outranks your competitors with less content and less links. We've thoroughly tested this service on many websites before launching it and have achieved incredible results, which you'll see on our landing page I'm about to share with you. Now you can finally buy a business and give it to us to grow it for you. To check out our SEO service, head to buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash SEO hyphen services and book a call to chat with us to see what is the best growth strategy for you and your website. That's buyingonlinebusinesses.com forward slash SEO services and the link will be in the description too. Justin, welcome to the pod. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Mate, YouTube, it's a beast and it's so damn good for building relationships with your audience, um, which builds trust and... More sales, right? Sorry about that. Umbrella so was uh, people starting. Um, sounds getting sorry. Oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna switch chairs real quick. The sun's uh, the the sun just blasted me. So, there we go. Much better. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. So I wanted to like I wanted to ask you. I just wanted to chat about YouTube and YouTube channels because starting YouTube channels are very profitable venture for businesses. But at the start, there's a fair bit of work that goes into it, right? Like, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of videos. Yeah, man. I mean, just like making a video in general, I feel like is a, you know, a hurdle for a lot of people, Uh, specifically if you're going to be on camera. Mm. I know that's uh, a lot of people don't like being on camera. There's so much that goes into a good YouTube video, like so much. We could record like a full podcast series on that. So I'll dive into that in a second. But I first want to ask you, when somebody first starts a channel, I've heard consistency is quite good. So how many videos should they be putting out regularly? Like I've heard where people will do 100 days of 100 videos, like bank them all up, which is pretty gnarly. But what's the what's the what's what's that look like when starting a channel in terms of like consistency? 
Yeah. So like one of our channels, I think we're sitting at about 115,000 subscribers and, you know, it was, it was slow in the beginning. We were putting out, you know, I, I never put out more than like two or three videos a week though, personally. Um, I know if you put out more, um, I mean, you know, cause like, like essentially what happens is one of those videos will end up taking off. And that's, that's really what happened for us is, you know, one specific, or you'll have like a couple videos that are driving most of your subscribers. So by putting a video out a day, you do have a lot more, um, you know, you have a lot more opportunities to have a video kind of go viral, if you will. Right. And so that's definitely a thing. Uh, I think if we were about a year in and one of our videos got shared by like a major blog and all of a sudden it just like that one thing just really started, um, you know, like catapulting us up and we just thought we went from like a thousand subscribers to like 10,000. I was like, Whoa, that's crazy. Mm. And that's when we really started posting a lot more. Um, but I do know, you know, there's a couple of reasons you would, you would do that. Number one, obviously you post a lot to hope that one really takes off. And then once you do get a lot of subscribers, you want to keep them engaged and really keep your watch time, your views, everything, um, you know, up. So I know, you know, we've been to different YouTube events and things like that, and they, they at least recommend posting on a schedule, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's every day or every day. Tuesday and Thursday or something like that. Um, just like people watch their favorite TV programs, they're watching their favorite YouTube creators. So absolutely. Absolutely. People know that, um, with my, that are on my email list and my audience, they, they open the emails every Thursday, go to YouTube and, and watch the podcast, which is probably why they're here watching this right now. <laughs> Quite meta. So yeah. when you, I'm curious, have you noticed that when you get to a certain level, it's worth trimming down the amount of videos in your video library on YouTube where it's worth deleting some. Is there, is, is there a good case for that? Um, I've never done that, mm. but um, honestly, I've never heard of somebody doing that because um, yeah, I mean, a lot of those videos, you know, I mean, I guess if you're like changing your brand or something along those lines, maybe, but um, I don't think, that really would, I, I don't know the benefit of that really. Um, unless, unless a specific video is like, you know, not performing well, maybe you're like, Hey, that's an older video and you're kind of digging into your analytics and you can see, Hey, if somebody starts watching this, they're leaving, you know, everybody's leaving the video after a minute. Yeah. Maybe that's not the best video to keep. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I, I, was, I was seeing the same thing so. underperforming videos and also that, when I was thinking about like the experience of somebody going through your channel, say they click on all your videos and you've got say 30% that are not the best videos, maybe they're old and they don't perform as well. And then you've got 70%, which are good. Would it be worth, you know, cutting off that 30% so you don't have the possibility of people going to those not so great videos and getting a, uh, not the best experience consuming your content versus them only going to the top ones. That was just, that was just my thinking. And, but I have heard people you know, talk about like, be careful if you are going to delete videos because you don't know that it could like, it could just take off like in a year's time, it could just, you know, get real popular that, that keyword or what it's ranking for is it could just take off. Right. Yeah, I mean, so like the video that really did take off for us, it was horrible. Um, <laughs> and like it was half of it was out of focus and it was just, it was bad. And, but there wasn't much content like that. So, you know, people really enjoyed it. But what we ended up doing instead of deleting it, because that, that video was ranking, it was like literally building our channel. We just ended up making a new video mm. and throwing like, um, you know, a card or whatever up and just saying, hey, click here to watch the updated one. And, you know, for whatever year it is. And we, we just remade the, the whole video, better production value, all that. Um, and then both of the videos really helped. So Cool, cool. Yeah. Did you find a lot of people would move, click on the card and move over to the updated video? Yeah, yeah. People love updated stuff. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So. Yeah. So there's so much that I want to talk about with you in terms of what makes a good video. There's two different types of videos, though. And videos within each of those brackets. And I'm talking about there's, 
YouTube specific content videos and then you got videos for ads. We'll talk about ads in a second because you know you can go down so many different ad creatives and uh, that's fascinating to me and I know that you've you've got a lot of experience with that. But for a video on YouTube that you want to rank and get organic traffic to, what makes a good YouTube video? Um, honestly, just th- they look at a lot of things, mm. um, but a lot of it is engagement. Like YouTube really wants people to stay on their platform. And if you have a really good video that gets people watching like the majority of the video, they're going to reward that, right? So something that we always looked at when we were building our channel is like um, percentage watched, right? So like how much of the video are people completing, right? And uh, then you start to see trends as you're putting these videos out. You're like, okay, our audience or, you know, the, the people in this space, particularly like this kind of content. And you can start to tailor your content strategy towards that. And I think that was, that's like the organic side of things. That's one of the biggest things you can do uh, is, is just have a video that people really like to watch and then um, watch a lot of, and then YouTube will reward that. Yeah. APV, right? Average percentage view, something that you can check in your studio, in you know the analytics of YouTube. And what I have found is, when you find those videos that are doing really well, they have a high average percentage viewed and then it's easier for you to know, okay, hang on, like let's replicate what's working in this video and backtrack where those spikes were in the video or where the, you know, when you're looking at analytics, as they watch the video, where did people drop off and how can you prevent them from dropping off and then do more of what they do with the spikes. And the spikes are typically where people will watch something and it was really good and then they'll click back on the video to replay that section again right and uh that's like the formula of how to use the videos that you already have that are doing well is to do use the data there to make your next videos better based on what people on your channel are liking right yeah and also not liking like you can see where people drop off Mm -hmm. like you'll see uh, if you're kind of they have like that that curve and you can see where people are dropping off um, we've had videos that I thought we're going to do fine. And, you know, there's just like, all of a sudden it's just like, Meow. yeah. And, you know, we were like, okay, what's happening here? Let's not do that again. Um, but at the same time, if you want to keep people on YouTube, just throw up like another recommended video at that point in the video. And, uh, you know, if people are like, well, I'm going to leave. Then they see that thing pop up. They're like, oh, maybe I'll watch this. Oh, that's uh, so you can really keep them on your cool. channel as well. Oh, I like that. So would you have like a card there? You can put a card in and say, hey, watch this video just before they start to drop off. So you keep them on your channel. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we, that's what we did. And we were able to, um, you know, get our, get, like keep people engaged with our specific content instead of looking at somebody else's and being like, well, maybe I'm going to go over here. That's brilliant. You know? That's brilliant. And when you did use a card, would you, would you choose something that's relevant to that video that you're already discussing or would you choose something that's just like really good and clickbaity that you think that that will like? Um, so a lot of times we would just push them to our most successful videos, cool. the ones that were getting the most subscribers. Cause like in your studio, you can check out, you know, which videos are driving the most subscribers, things like that. Mm-hmm. And we would just push them to our most popular videos uh, or YouTube lets you like, you know, the video that's most or whatever best for, the specific viewer or whatever, you know, they'll, I don't know how they know, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, in terms of like keeping people engaged, is there any other way that you, that you've worked out that helps pe- keep people engaged other than getting them to another video and looking at the data? Um, I mean, really just a lot of it is, you know, we were publishing videos for years and years, right? Mm. And you really like, pay attention to the analytics, what's happening in your videos, and you'll start to see trends, right? Like, what does this audience like? You know, certain videos will get a lot of views, certain ones won't. Uh, and it really just comes to comes down to like, you know, see what kind of trends are you seeing in the content you're pushing out and, um, you know, what people are watching and you know what's getting the most views what's getting the most searches as well um you know that keyword research all that kind of stuff uh and then also checking out other people's channels in the space like you know we would do that we'd be like oh that was a good video we don't have a video like that maybe we should make a video like that you know 
was doing just this just yesterday on a coaching call. Um, a client of mine is, you know, wanting to grow their YouTube channel um, in the college ministry area um, or niche and competitive research. It works in all different aspects of business. See what your competitors are doing that's working really well for them and how can you create content that, you know, people are obviously liking that. How do you create a similar type of content? Obviously not copying. Uh, but how do you create a similar type of content that is valuable as well for your audience? Um, and we're also looking at the titles. We're looking at the thumbnails and seeing like what's working in that specific niche, in that specific industry. Because mm-hmm. the YouTube videos that I would do for my channel and the thumbnails that we would use are going to be completely different to what a thumbnail should look like for a different channel, right? Right, right. And also, I mean, if you find other channels that are putting out good content, um, like we, I ended up, you know, once you, once you start to build up your channel a bit more, um, other creators are very open to collaborations, mm-hmm. right? So I did a lot of collaborations where we would just film content separately. It'd be like, you know, the top five tools that we use or whatever. And we'd each, you know, I'd do three, he'd do two, whatever it might be, uh, and edit that stuff together and just be like, Hey, if you, we both post that video to our channel, same video and be like, by the way, you know, this is a collaboration with so-and-so check them out here. Um, and that drove quite a few subscribers as well. And it really helps build your audience. Love it. Tapping into other people's audiences. Yeah. It's really, really cool. So growing a channel with ads, I know that there's two different types or a few different types of ads, right? You can have ads that can help you grow your YouTube channel. You can have ads that can help you grow your business in revenue more directly, right? You're more leaning and you're more focused on helping people drive leads with ads. Is is that, am I correct in saying that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we do a lot of, um, a lot of different things. Uh, I've built up a few different channels by running, uh, they're called in feed ads now, mm-hmm. but basically those are the ones where somebody searches for a keyword and, um, you know, you'll see those ads or those videos at the top. Mm-hmm. Those are more content type videos. Mm-hmm. So those work really well to build a channel. Uh, and you just target, basically, if you would want to rank for a specific keyword, you just target that keyword, have your video show up and, uh, you know, hopefully people enjoy it. They subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but we do more yeah, direct response stuff with, um, in-stream ads specifically. And those are those pre-roll ads or whatever. And, um, yeah, that, that's kind of been what i've done for for a long time now so yeah so i wanted to that's why i wanted to get you on i wanted to dig into those in stream ads the ad creative there's so many different types of ad creative but there's also seems like there's a bit of a formula on some of the things that you should do psychologically and call to actions and at different points in the video so what are some of those you know ways to script or run through an ad creative or like what are the must haves if you're wanting to get people to click away from YouTube and opt into something or buy something? What are the what are the top things a video would need in that ad creative? Yeah, for sure. So I mean obviously the number one thing when you're creating a video ad, like the most important part of an ad, um, is really the hook, right? You need to hook somebody because we all know you have you have that first five seconds where you can either skip the ad or continue to watch, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, truth be told, you actually kind of need to rehook people every whatever, 10, 15 seconds or something. Yeah. Uh, because people have, um, span, so I, I always said like people have short attention spans, but um, I was just at an event at Google and they brought something up that I was like, Man, that's, that's a really good point. Um, they were like, people don't have short attention spans. They have short consideration spans, <laughs> um, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah that makes sense. It does. Uh, Cause they're like, dude, people will sit down and watch 30, 40 minute videos, mm, true. but true. you know, you have to get them to, you know, give them a good reason, all that. So, um, you know, I have a, a YouTube ad library and we study a lot of what's working with YouTube ads specifically. And we, we've basically like analyzed a bunch of different ads that, you know, from, from the same channel, go into the same landing page, same offer, everything. And a lot of times the difference between an ad that really takes off and an ad that doesn't is the hook. So um, that, that first, you know, whatever, 15 seconds or whatever, if you can come up with something that really, you know, is going to relate to your audience, that's going to be huge. Um, Hitting on any, you know, pain points, unbelievable statements, um, 
coming out with proof works really well. Like, Hey, I want to show you how we got this result or how these students got this result, right? Um, flashing some proof up there that way they're like, okay, but you know, I, I want that. Um, things like that. Uh, so the hook, and then we have like the body of the ad as well. Uh, and that's like, you know, just a little bit of education. What, what do they need to know? Knocking out objections, you know, anything like that. And then obviously the call to action, which, um, you used to have to throw like a really hard call to action and like click the link on this video. Mm. Um, now, you know, people know that, yeah. I mean, there's, there's buttons it's everywhere back right. in the day. There weren't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're like, Oh, okay. I can click this, you know? Yeah. Um, and you get your call to action on the button and you get your companion banner and a few other things as well. So you can, uh, you know, use all that to your advantage as well. Now I want to, that's awesome, man. Thanks for sharing that. I want to talk about the hook. It seems like it is the most important thing. Um, what I have noticed is calling out your audience at the start in a hook and also um, sort of a pre, pre-qualify, like having them pre-qualify the, whether the, they're your audience or you're not. For example, if you're selling a surfboard um, or if you're talking about, you know, surfboard, surf coaching or something like that, how to become a, or, you know, we're talking about snowboarding before we recorded this. If you're talking about snowboarding, snowboard coaching, uh, at the start of the video, would something like this work? Hey, if you want to improve your snowboarding, make sure you, you know, understand these first three things. And then anybody that skis or anybody that, you know, does not snowboard, they're not going to continue with the ad, right? They're going to, they're going to click away and you won't need to pay for that ad being shown. Is that, Am I correct in saying that? And is there any other strategies that oh, can sure. improve improve upon that basic thing that I just mentioned? Yeah, I mean, like you like you pretty much nailed it right there. The hook, it's going to pre-qualify the right people, but it's also going to push the wrong people away. Um, and obviously, you don't want everybody skipping your ad. If everybody's skipping your ad, your targeting's off, right? And there's this bunch of different metrics you can you can look at when it comes to that. Uh, and Google actually, you know, because you only pay when somebody watches um, 30 seconds of your ad or the whole thing, whichever comes first, or if they click on your link, right? Well, that being said, Google doesn't want to just give away a bunch of ad inventory that they could be getting views and could be getting paid on. So there's a thing called view rate, and it's like number of impressions versus number of views. And the higher your view rate, the more your more people are watching, the better your targeting is, the better your ad, your hook. Google's going to reward that and give you a little bit lower cost per uh, view as well, right? Which is a good thing. Um, but if everybody's skipping your ad, Google's gonna start to see that. They're gonna be like, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't be showing this person's ad all the time because, you know, nope, everybody's skipping it. We're not getting paid. Uh, so there, there is a, a fine line, you know, you, you gotta balance that. But, but yeah, ultimately the hook does push the wrong people away, hooks the right people. Um, yeah, and just like really just calling out your audience. Uh, and there's a lot of different targeting options you can do, but I like to make ads specifically for, um, you know, targeting options that we're going with and really calling out specific groups of people just with the hook. Um, you know, if I'm targeting like ClickFunnels users, for example, I might mention funnel hacking mm -hmm. and they're going to be like, what? Oh, you like I I know funnel hacking like it resonates with them. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and we've actually done that, and it, it did extremely well. But um. But yeah, just different things like that. Just keep in mind who your specific audience is, and really try and speak to them. Um, and and good things happen. How much education is needed now in a in a YouTube video ad? Like, can you just go straight into like, hey, if you want to learn to you know be a better snowboarder you know you you know um do you do you go straight into coaching as a or, or like a sharing value uh and proving like how big of that is or is there a you know a, a better way to do it nowadays because i haven't ran youtube ads in a while or a couple of years and um you know i've been out of the youtube ad game for a little bit now is there other other ways to do this yeah. I mean, like there's obviously like straight up curiosity based where you're just like, Hey, I want to show, like I've, I had an ad, we were doing an affiliate promotion and it was for a make money online program or whatever on ClickBank. And I just took a bunch of testimonials from their sales page. And I was like, Hey, I want to show you how so-and-so is making this much money from home 
without you know any prior experience and how so and so is doing this and blah 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 and how you can do the same and we're going to teach you on this webinar or whatever um you know click the link on the video and i'll show you more that was it like we shared literally nothing except for proof right and knocked out some objections like even if you have no prior online experience or whatever so that works pretty well that's still i still see that working um testimonials work great because uh, again that's that's the same thing if you can like lead with proof you don't have to do yeah you don't really have to um you know sell them that much they're just gonna be like well if all those people are doing it like that seems pretty cool maybe i could you know that sounds good um so th there's a lot of different things you can do there uh but like for, for the snowboarding example or whatever um that one you might want to you know kind of be like hey there's three specific reasons that you're not getting better at snow you know so you go out snowboarding whatever however many times a week and you just don't see your tricks improving or whatever it might be be like you know we've been coaching x number of students and we found it comes down to three specific things right um and then just kind of giving a little bit of value on there and then just just like hitting on the like three common mistakes that you know somebody trying to learn this trick is making or whatever and be like and we have a whole nother video where we'll you know dive into that all right that way they're kind of like oh okay maybe i should listen to this person love it love that and so what percentage of uh people that you work with are getting people to a free a piece of free value or opt in for something for free versus you know a straight up money grab sale and like so i mean it, it depends on Right. It depends on the price point, yeah. I would say. Yeah. Um, you know, lead gen, YouTube ads are great for lead gen. So, like they work amazingly well for, um, you know, coaches, consultants, anybody that has like a webinar book to call or, you know, webinar to book a call funnel. Those things work extremely well. Uh, and I think a lot of the reason that works is because people, you know, they resonate with you seeing you on video. Right. And they're like, yeah, this person seems good. Like, you know, whatever there. Um, but I mean, we, we've ran a lot of direct to, um, you know, just like direct to sales page and, and things like that. Um, it works well with a little bit lower ticket offers. And I, I see lower ticket offers are coming back a lot now uh, with funnels behind them. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I guess it kind of just depends. It, it really does work for anything. But I will say that if you have a lower ticket product, you do need a funnel behind it to really make up for, um, you know, because you're probably going to be spending a little bit more on the front end sale than like, you're just not going to be profitable off of, you know, a $47 product. Um, you know, you, you need a couple upsells or some kind of back end or whatever it might be. And I think that goes for not just YouTube ads that goes for anything. Like the cost of ads is only going up. It's not going to go down. Um, you know, it, it's becoming more and more competitive. More people are doing it. Like back in the day, you could throw a YouTube ad up and run it to like whatever. And you're like, oh man, we're making six times our money back on the front end. Like, you know, with one single product is not, not quite like that anymore, you know? Sometimes, and that's a really good point that you bring up because if people are trying to make money straight away from the get-go on the ads and they're not, they could give up. Whereas if they understand they have a good remarketing system like say email remarketing system maybe they maybe it will take them you know five months until they get roi on the ad spend right do you, is do you work with brands that or have seen i mean I've, I've i've spoken to brands that will say hey we'll we'll lose money for you know a year until you know and keep them in our system and then we know that our our customer lifetime value will be you know, high and we'll get an ROI after a year and we'll continue to do so, but they'll lose a bit of money on the front end. Do you see that becoming more regular? It depends, but like, I mean, the, the quicker you can recoup, obviously the better. Uh, but like I, you know, and it all comes down to knowing your numbers. Like we sell recurring software, right? I know that I can go, I can spend like four times a monthly sale to on, on one of my softwares to, and I'm still making money. Like it sucks. I'm like, well, there goes, you know, whatever, 400 bucks to make a hundred dollar sale. But like, I'm still profitable at that. 
um, you know, newer businesses, you're probably not going to be able to know that right away. And I still don't like doing it. I'm like, man, that sucks. Uh, which is why we're constantly rolling out, you know, new offers like lead magnets and just, you know, providing value up front and really working to, um, get that sale sooner. But, uh, you know, that being said, I, I think it is, um, it is definitely a thing that I, I see a lot of businesses, specifically businesses with like higher ticket back ends and things like that. Um, and even, even a lot of people that are doing webinars now, they're not, you know, used to be able to just run a bunch of traffic to a webinar and, you know, you're profitable on the front end, basically, you know, you spend a thousand bucks, you're making like 1200 back or whatever. Now it's probably, you know, a little more spend 1200, make a thousand, whatever, but there's, there's more, um, you know, people are working on the back ends more. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. And, you know, you know, up to like cross sells, like whatever you can do to, to uh, maximize that customer value. Really. Absolutely. Absolutely. Increase your AOV really average order. Value yeah, definitely. By adding more value to them. Uh, it is a tricky one, right? Like with running and I've done it um, with our membership as well, like running ads to a membership and knowing is really important to know how long people stay and why and you know your retention rate and your customer lifetime mm -hmm. value to know how much you're going to spend and also the lead time that it might take for them to be in your email list until they actually decide to join there's so many factors to consider with tube uh, and you mentioned you have that with with tube sift tell us tell us like People don't know what, like for people who don't know what TubeSift is, like what do you guys do? How do you guys help, you know, video creators and people use it? Yeah, so, um, you know, TubeSift is a, a targeting software. So there's a number of different ways that you can target on YouTube. Uh, one of those is putting your video in front of, like putting your video ad in front of specific videos you know your audience is going to be watching. Mm -hmm. uh, those videos have to be monetized. Uh, and Google made some changes to that, but it's still doable. Um, I've heard a lot of people be like, oh, they got rid of placement yeah, they targeting. Started they started changing not. it a they little bit, didn't of... they? But yeah, it can still do with placements. Well, they, I mean, they moved it around and uh, changed the way it works, but it's it's still a thing. So um, it's just a little yeah, different than it was. But um, so the TubeSift does that and it also finds, you know, helps you build like custom audiences, things like that. Um, so, so yeah, that's I think we started that in like 2000, rolled it out, end of 2014 maybe. So it's been... It's been a minute. Um, and then we have Video Ad Vault, which is basically like a spy tool. It's like a Facebook ad library, but for YouTube. Um, and that's kind of the, that one's a lot newer. Um, but that's, you know, I, I enjoy studying ad creatives and like, you know, the, the like we've been talking about, you know, what makes a good video, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that, that, that's the one that really gets me excited now as well. So, so Video Ad Vault being, they can check out, all the different creatives that have been successful and then break them down on why and then reverse engineer them to be able to use them for their businesses, right? Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Or ads that didn't work, right? I mean you yeah. could you could search by advertiser, you could search by, you know, if you're like, hey, I want to find all the ads that are going to whatever, webinarjam.com, mm -hmm. clickfunnels.com, mm -hmm. you know. You right. can find all of the ads linking to specific domains. Uh, you can find, you know, different keywords, all that kind of stuff. So you can really see all the different ads in any niche. And then, um, you, you know, by looking at the ones that are getting the most views and you can see like average daily views, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of analytical data in there that we have. Awesome. And you can start to analyze what's going on, what's working, what's not, and then kind of apply that to what you're doing and have a much better chance at, uh, you know, having a successful ad right out of the gate instead of, you know, Spending like, well, that didn't work. Is this, this going to work? Is this yeah. going to work? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially because ad creative, uh, you know, recording ads can definitely stack up as well on the cost on, on the production. Oh, yeah. And, um, <clears throat> I'm, I, I, I can't not ask you about the ad placements, uh, or video placements, how how are they how have they changed that right so before you could actually go away and look at your competitor and say all right cool i want to put my video ad on their video it can be an in-stream ad or it can be you know something at the end of the video um and you could easily do that in the back end of you know youtube ads or google ads how do how has that changed now like is it just technically harder or how do you do that 
So basically what they did is they removed content targeting, which is placements, keywords, topics, if that's it. Uh, they removed content targeting from campaigns with a goal. And essentially what a campaign with a goal is, is you tell Google, hey, I want you to optimize for this specific conversion. And their AI kind of takes over and they will, you know, get a couple conversions and then Google will be like, okay, cool. This specific placement was working or, you know, this targeting is working with this ad. So it'll kind of shift your budget for you automatically. They, so they removed that. You can still set up campaigns without a goal. And I mean, campaigns with a goal are within, I think they set those up maybe like three years ago is when they first rolled those out anyway. So it's still a pretty new thing, even having Google manually or automatically optimize your campaigns. When I first started running ads, we were like, I was going in every day looking at the different keywords. How many views did this keyword get? How many views did this placement get? Like pausing them, adjusting bids, mm -hmm. all that kind of Negative stuff. keywords. Google okay. made it. All that stuff, hey? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, so essentially in a campaign without a goal, it's just like it used to be like three years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. That's really, that's really good. So story. yeah, it still works because you can, you, you just have to do a little more work. You know, <laughs> you, the goals, you know, you want to optimize for opt-ins or leads or whatever it is. There's the different types of goals you can choose in, in the YouTube ads, but setting up one without a goal, mm -hmm. it's like you can still, you'll still personally as a business have a goal for the ad, but you're not just claiming um, to YouTube that this is what they you want them to optimize. You can manually optimize it a bit more yourself, right? Yeah, and it, it still tracks. Like you can still track conversions. Yeah. You just have to like manually, you have Add to like go in every day and be like, okay, yeah. here's, you know, like this is good. This is not, let's, you know, delete this placement, whatever it might be. So it's definitely still a thing. You just kind of have to um, dig in a little bit more. And then what we've been doing is, basically setting up a campaign without a goal, using placements to train a pixel, get a bunch of pixel fires. Cause it, you know, you're still getting great conversions and everything with placements. It's just not, they're not quite as scalable anymore because um, you know, with Google's AI, what happens is they'll start to learn, Hey, th these kinds of people are buying or opting in or whatever your goal is. And then they'll be like, let's get more of those people. And they'll put your ad in front. You know, they, they have a optimized targeting where they basically, start to throw random people not random people but they start to throw people at your uh at your ad that or throw your ad in front of the right people um so you're not getting that whole thing but you are still you know putting it in front of the right people so. you mentioned uh about training a pixel which makes me think about uh in tube sift you mentioned you help people create custom audiences is that like is that one of the ways like and, and like how does that sort of what does that look like for so i guess for somebody that's like new to this whole thing they're like why would i want a custom audience <laughs> so what sort of custom audiences are you creating say for like somebody selling snowboarding coaching and then how is that sort of you know how do you help them create that with tube sift like what does that look like yeah yeah so so essentially with these custom audiences. There, there's a number of ways that you can build these things. And one of them is um, you, you can build audiences of people who have visited specific websites, right? Or people who browse, the like Google says browse websites similar to, right? So if you go, you know, like people might be looking at like snowboardermagazine.com or, um, you know, whatever, Burton ride like all these different companies you know hey like these people are obviously snowboarders right um so with basically what you can do is you can take all you can compile all those urls put them into a custom audience and google will build you an audience of people who have visited those websites and similar websites and one of the newer features we added in the tube sift is basically the ability to type in a keyword and it will spit out all of these websites that people would be visiting um, and then you just throw those into Google and then you create your custom audience. So those, those work extremely well. We found. Yeah. Because you're targeting website viewers, not just YouTube viewers. Right. And then when those people who are, mm -hmm. say I've viewed something on looking at Burton, um, maybe I'm buying a new snowboard. 
on the website, I'm looking at it. When I go to YouTube to watch something completely else, maybe it's an educational video on a different sport like surfing, then I can get an ad still in front of me for, you know, how to become a better snowboarder, right? That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's essentially being able to retarget other people's websites, which is kind of absurd. Um, it's crazy. But I mean, you can do it because, because Google has all of that first party data. I mean, how many websites have Google analytics, right? Mm -hmm. um, Google, like Gmail, yeah. everyone uses Gmail. Google search, right? They know exactly what you're searching for. And not only Chrome, what you're searching on for, Chrome, but what websites, yes, yeah. like what websites you're going to after you do a search. Like they know all kinds of stuff about everybody. And that's the that's what you're buying when you're buying Google ads, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, that's why people are getting such great ROI. I think it should be a good time to mention um, about third-party cookies. I'm not sure if you know too much about third-party cookies, Justin, but uh, that's how um, Google tracks and puts ads in front of people on websites, like when they're scrolling through a blog. And a lot of people listening are people that are buying these sorts of blogs and are worried about the third-party cookie being removed, whereas... The third party cookie, like it's not the only way that Google is tracking you, right? Like, and you mentioned like this, if you've got Chrome, if you've got Gmail, if you've got Google Analytics, you know, attached to your site and all these other sites, there's so Do you have many, an Android? Sorry, <laughs> like, and, or Android, yeah, like, and a Google phone, like, yeah, <laughs> you just, yeah, they can remove Google, they can remove these third party cookies. Um, and what they're doing that for is for privacy issues. And as soon as they remove them, they're going to have some other way that they will release is like actually probably just better targeting, right? Do you, do you know much about this third-party cookie thing at all? Or Yeah, a little bit. Um, you know, I've, I've like kept up to date on, on some of it. I know that's like a big part of the reason Facebook had to remove mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff, right? But, but the thing with Google, it's not – so like, like uh, Facebook was like buying data from other people and things like that, like buying third-party data. Google doesn't have third party data really. They they're like like we were just talking about, they are collecting all of that data themselves. Party, yeah. And to even use any of their stuff, you have to agree to that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean they know every search that you're doing, like ev like they just know. Yeah. So um so that that's the cool thing. I don't know if that's a cool thing, but like <laughs> um it's cool as an advertiser, but like <laughs> Yeah. It's definitely cool as an advertiser and it can be cool as a consumer as well. I'll give you for example, like um, I don't like going on social media and when I want to buy something, um, like it saves a specific thing, I'll go to Instagram and just type in a couple of things or I'll yell into my phone um, a few keywords and then what will pop up on Instagram is like all the things. So I, so I don't have to use Google to search through things. I can just use Instagram for shopping. Like I use that, I use it that way. Um, I think it can be beneficial if you use it the right way. And Justin, such a, such a fun chat, man. I know we went down a bunch of different rabbit holes, but yeah, guys, check out TubeSift, check out Video Vault. I'll put links to those in the show notes, guys, because that ability to get your com competitors, um, like a big list of your competitors, chuck them into YouTube and target them. Phenomenal. I love that tool. It's cool. Thank you. Yeah, man. And thanks for, thanks for having me. And, uh, yeah, we, we got to, uh, get out. If you're up in Colorado, hit me up. We can go snowboarding. I know, I know all the mountains around here. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Maybe next season I'll come up and we'll go for a shred. It'd be fun. For sure. Dude. Yeah. Everybody that is listening. Thank you for listening. If you know somebody that has a business and is thinking about running YouTube ads or thinking about growing a YouTube channel, make sure you share this podcast episode with them. There's so many rabbit holes we went down that it's going to be fascinating value for your friends that you share this with. So thanks again, and I'll speak to you soon. Hey, YouTube watcher. If you thought that video is good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.